Thank you for joining us for this webinar for parents of newly diagnosed children, What Can I Do? Today's webinar is hosted by Dr. Kathy Pratt, Director of the Indiana Resource Center for Autism. Today's panel is comprised of members of an Indiana ABA work group that includes representatives from state agencies, ABA centers, universities, parent advocacy organizations, and school districts. The goal of this work group is to work together to enhance the relationships between schools and ABA programs and to help families become informed consumers. We appreciate all of the contributors to this webinar. So without any further ado, let's start with the slides. Michelle, do you wanna go first? Um, sure, I'd be very happy to. Thank you for inviting me to, to join this panel. Um, I'm a parent of a 22-year-old with autism who, who just finished high school. So um, coming at this from the perspective of having walked in the shoes of having a newly diagnosed child and going through everything that, that parents go through when that, when that happens. And um, one of the things that I think most parents find when they do any type of research, whether it's research on the internet or talking to a provider, talking to their doctor, um, what people say is early intervention is critical. And um, you know that is, is most definitely the case. Um, we're very lucky that we have a lot more options today um, in terms of early intervention. Um, and so, so looking at what your options are and also looking at the unfortunate reality is you also have to look at how those options can be funded. Um, and so doing the research and contacting your advocacy organizations to get information on that is really critical. Um, one thing in particular that the Arc of Indiana and, and my position at the Arc of Indiana can assist with is the funding options for um, early intervention and for ongoing treatment throughout the lifespan. So I want to definitely make sure that parents are aware that that resource is out there. And uh, you can go to the Arc of Indiana's website. Our insurance tab or insurance page has uh, lots of good information on there about funding options, but also families are more than welcome to contact the Arc directly via our Facebook page, email, uh, or calling our central office, and they will get you to a family advocate who can help answer your individual questions about what funding resources might be available to you. And I think one of the things that I would encourage is, is that as you're pursuing funding options, do it sooner than later, because oftentimes it's quite a long process to get access to those funding options. So if your child is between the ages of zero up to the age of three, you contact your first steps provider. Once the child hits the age of three, then public school or the school district kicks into gear. And so then you would contact them. And we know that many of our parents are pursuing ABA programming, which makes it even more important that we start looking at funding options. Um, and just so that you know, within your local uh, special education planning districts, we have autism leaders or consultants that we connect with on an ongoing basis. So you should, within your district, have some expertise that you can connect with who can help kind of guide you through that process as well. So one of the things that will happen is, is that you are going to be on a journey to visit a lot of different doctors and specialists, a whole range of professionals. And one of the things that many families have told me is, is that putting all that information together can be really overwhelming. So one of the first things that you might wanna do is to develop a system for organizing and maintaining records. Because it seems like you'll be asked multiple times to repeat the same information. And I think the other thing is, is that this is a journey um, and it's going to involve learning about and understanding your child's deficits and challenges but I think the other thing that you have to realize is, and is important to document, acknowledge your child's gifts and strengths. You know, each of your children have wonderful qualities and wonderful gifts. And I think too often we focus on those deficits and challenges instead of building upon those, those strengths and gifts. So have that expectation of professionals to do this as well as to really acknowledge those gifts and strengths. Penny Gregory. Hello. Hello, I'm sorry. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. 
Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you for inviting me today. This is so exciting. Anytime I have a chance to talk about um, autism and ways to help parents, I want to get involved. Um, a few years ago, well, 15 years ago now, um, my nephew was born, and uh, right around the time he turned about two or three, we started noticing different things. And, you know, at the time I was a special educator, and so um, I started talking to my sister about things that we noticed, and I remember how. Um, scary that time was for both of us because we really didn't know a whole lot and I just want to say that he's doing um, remarkably well now just just a great young man uh, just won some awards at school for um, um, his online work actually he did better at, at home with sort of um, um, a schedule and you know making his own schedule as he's getting older so typical teenager but I just wanted to just um, say I remember um, all those years ago feeling sort of alone and so what we did did was quickly co um, connected with people in our community and so I just want to say don't 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 you know if you're feeling alone it's, it's totally natural and normal um, but don't stay there try to get connected with um, the resources that um, in your community and, and one of the resources or the websites that I really like is autismspeaks.org um, it can be a lot of We may have lost her. I'm sorry, um, I'm, sorry. I'm back. Um, I am mobile. Um, it can be a lot to process, and you probably have a lot of questions and possibly fears or concerns. So on this website, you can find a 100-day kit um, that will take you through the first 100 days of a recent diagnosis, um, and they have sectioned it off for young children, um, for children 5 to 13, and then for adults. So it helps you learn more about autism and how to access services for your child. Um, and then if you've had uh, the, the diagnosis in the last six months, you can request even a hard copy kit and they will send it to um, the local FedEx um, um, building or office wherever you are uh, um, at, at absolutely no cost to you um, by dialing a phone number there. It also has personal stories from families and information and support for your family. So um, just tons of resources and ways to connect. And, you know, again, um, making sure that you also utilize your local school districts. There's a lot more information out there now than it was when we were trying to um, figure out, you know, what was next for, for my nephew. So um, just be encouraged and, and get excited because it is, it is quite a wonderful journey. Steve Vwig. Well, let me thank you also for bringing this group together to share all this information. And I think um, the order of this is nice because what I wanted to make sure people know about is the Centers for Disease Controls Learn the Signs Act early materials, which are targeted for birth to five. So as Dr. Pratt mentioned, well, everyone's mentioned, early intervention is really important. And, and it may be um, helpful to have language to talk about what your kids are doing. And as Dr. Pratt said, we want to look for what, what are they actually doing that's positive as well as the things that are concerning. So I think people might find that the CDC's Milestone Tracker, which is a free app, which is based on the Learn the Science Act early materials, is an easy way to learn about what child development looks like and gives language that we can all use as parents when we're, or grandparents when we're talking about what our kids do and when we have questions or concerns about it. And the app is designed so that you can look at it, you can read about it, you can watch a video, you can keep track, you can put the child's name in, their birth date, and keep track. You could show the doctor or other professional the things that you're seeing and wondering about. And this link here on the screen for the actearlyindiana.org is a, a resource that um, the Center for Autism has helped support to just make available a whole collection of resources if anybody's looking for what to do in Indiana. And in there, you'll also find the link to the CDC where you can find more information about the Learn the Science Act early materials that helps uh, get other kinds of information. If you're not into an app, you could get pamphlets, you can get storybooks, you can just look online and see all the information that's available there. What I think is really helpful about this is it, is it provides language for us to talk about child development in terms that we understand and to be able to, to identify what kids are doing, but then also to identify when there are some concerns or questions. 
And as a member of the Child Development Center team in Indianapolis at the School of Medicine, I know families are struggling to find places to get diagnostics right now as in, in the period of the pandemic. That's been a real challenge. And just to acknowledge that some of the tools that diagnosticians use to make a diagnosis simply aren't able to be used on telemedicine or um, using PPE when we're using face masks. So it's just a challenge we have to all try to figure out and to be patient as we're trying to figure out how do we get back into being able to see kids and make appropriate diagnoses. In the meantime, I think these kinds of resources that we're talking about can be very helpful because we're all trying to figure out the best way to do that. So thanks for listening. And if you have questions about the CDC materials, um, certainly I know my contact information is available on, at the actearlyindiana.org website. Nancy Holzapfel. Well, thank you, Kathy, for asking me to be a part of this. It's a uh, great opportunity to share information with our families. So thank you for, again, inviting me. One of the things that I wanted to share is that each family should access their child's local education agency webpage for resources. On that page, they should find the continuous learning plan that each district had to prepare for the um, return of school in the fall. And also there is a tab where you can access the Department of Education. And within that, there is a tab that we have, it is titled for parents. And underneath that tab, we have information that ranges from the Ed Plan Connect, which allows families to electronically sign, sign IEPs to a list of summer 2020 camps and programs if they're virtual or actually starting in July in person. So there's a range of information that we try to keep on that tab for families if they have questions. There um, is also the link to Lisa Paddock, who is a participant today from InSource, a parent liaison that could also provide information. And within the Office of Special Education, we have specialists who also can provide information or support to families. One of the things that we released in um, lieu of the COVID-19 was a list of different types of masks because we understand some children have sensor, sensory issues and they couldn't wear the typical mask. So we did research and we found information on face shields, clear mask, and then your typical cloth mask. If your child would have sensory issues and you feel like these would not be suitable, you just need to reach out to your school have a case conference and as a group try to determine what would be the safest avenue for your child to return to school. Another thing I would suggest to families is you need to find a support group. I have been doing, uh, I have been in special education for 34 years and over my time I have never encountered two students who were exactly alike. So every child is different, every child is unique. So guidance that we may put out may pertain to a group of children, but maybe not all children in the sense that it um, each child is unique and we're trying to capture everyone. Um, what I would suggest is the parent support group they can give you guidance, they can give you suggestions, they can be the person that you can bounce ideas off of, um, have a cup of coffee with, um, just talk through many things. In my time, when I've talked with families, you know, every family is unique and their needs are unique. So as we um, travel down this road, and as Kathy said, it's a journey, um, public education, your child will attend at the start of age three and they can stay until the age of 22. So it's always, always best to have an open communication with your school district because 
the ultimate goal should be what's best for the child. And when you have that relationship with your schools, the best outcome for your child is what the whole team should be looking for at that time. Also on the uh, Department of Education's website, there is a list of resources that's not just for families, it's for um, educators as well. And anybody can access the Department of Ed's website. There's a tab that speaks to the COVID-19 and it offers up all kinds of guidance and suggestions for families as we um, travel down this road of when schools will reopen within the next month or so. So if um, anyone would have questions for the Department of Education Office of Special Ed, please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Nancy. And you'll see that I connected to Nancy's slide. We have a list of all the parent groups that we know of in the state of Indiana on the website for the Indiana Resource Center for Autism. So Mary Burton is a director of special ed who has been involved with the uh, ABA work group for several years and, and we've really appreciated her leadership and guidance. And so these were the suggestions that she provided. One was to trust your public school. You know, the teachers and staff are dedicated to ensure that your child grows not only academically, but also socially and emotionally. And there are many caring professionals in, in education. Um, build those relationships and they can help your children. Understand that schools offer many services at no cost for your child. So um, when your child is receiving services, the school district will at no cost have your child go through a diagnostic evaluation to determine educational eligibility. Your child may need a medical diagnosis through a doctor, a diagnostician, but in order to receive services through special education, they have to go through an assessment process to determine what eligibility category they fall under. And that diagnostic process is provided for free through the school district. We also know that many public schools offer support for parents, such as parent groups, training sessions, online resources. They really, many of them will try to reach out to families in multiple ways. And so call your local school and ask to speak to the director of special ed. And again, on our website, we have a list of the autism leaders. So you can look up for your district who would be the key person for you to contact. Michelle. Thank you, Kathy. One thing that I wanted, um, just as a parent myself who's, who's farther along this journey, um, wanted to really stress with you that uh, a good friend of mine said to me when my daughter was diagnosed, autism is a marathon, it's not a sprint. So, you know, be kind to yourself, don't panic. Um, there's this real uh, pressure that you feel as a parent to go out and find the answer or the cure or the best treatment or, and to get things done quickly, but, but take, take a breath. It's, it's gonna be okay. There are lots of supports out there. There are lots of parents out there who've been farther along on this journey that you can lean on and ask questions for. Um, try as hard as you can to not make decisions from a place of panic um, because that may not be the best decision if you're making a decision out of fear or out of panic. Um, and then also to, you know, just kind of be careful about where you find advice and where you find resources, um, especially about interventions. Um, Facebook is a wonderful way to connect with people and it, it can be a wonderful tool for many things. But the flip side is that there's a lot of bad and accurate and, and sometimes even dangerous information suggested about treatments for autism or cures for autism on some, some social media Media platforms. So just be careful and make sure that you really ask, um, you know, professionals um, about any intervention that you're thinking about trying um, and ask about its efficacy, but also ask about its safety. Um, and then also, I think the other thing I would say is um, try to find the joy along the journey too. Um, getting a diagnosis of autism with your child can, can, can be devastating and can be very scary. 
um, and the unknown of what your child's future is going to, is going to be like can be very scary. Um, but that is something that's common to all parents. None of us know as parents what the end result is going to be for our children. None of us know if we've made the right decision until 20 years later. So, so we do all feel that in commonality. Um, so try to find some joy in this process. What does your child love? And, and what is he or she interested in? And then try to use that to keep them engaged with you and with your family and with, with your social circle. Um, try to use those things that he or she loves to keep them engaged with other children um, and to keep them communicating and at least trying to use words or pointing or gestures to get what they want and get their idea, what they're looking for across. Um, just for example, when my daughter was, was very young and tiny, um, she really loved dress up stuff and pink sparkly things. And so, and so do the other neighbor girls. So we used that as a way to get the other neighbor girls to come over and try to interact with her and to get her interacting with them. And, um, you know, just kind of bringing joy into that and using those joyful things and those joyful moments to also be teaching moments. Um, because we as parents, for all of our children, we're their first teachers. And um, so, so trust your gut and, you know, try, try as, as hard as it is, try not to get too panicked about running out and finding the cure. There's just a lot of options out there now, which is wonderful, but also scary too. So look at good quality resources for information and then find those things that your child loves and use them to, you know, kind of keep that uh, communication and that interaction going. And I apologize, there's some drilling right outside my window right now. So I hope that's not interfering too much. Um, but, and then to reach out to other parents and, and just share and, um, and you don't have to sugarcoat it. We, we, we can feel that comfort with each other that we can kind of tell our stories realistically what's really going on in our lives and get that comfort from each other as well. And I'm going to mute now because there's more drilling coming. <laughs> okay, Lisa Paddock. Hi, thank you, Kathy. Once again, I really appreciate being able to be part of uh, this opportunity to speak to families whose children have recently been diagnosed. Um, I do work for InSource as the parent liaison at DOE and am the parent of a young adult with autism. So uh, like Michelle, have walked through this journey and everyone that's on this panel um, can really vouch for the fact that um, no matter which part you play, this is a journey, whether you're helping families or you're part of the family's um, journey. So I would particularly like to talk just a moment about building your team and the fact that uh, when you come from early intervention, which is so important, that team might look one way. And then when it's time to move to the public school or perhaps a private school or some other entity, it might look a little different. But please know that there are teams uh, and team members that can work with you and can be part of your child's life and yours, and that it is important to build a medical team, behavioral team, a special education team, support team, that will help you through. Because um, as Michelle was talking, it is not a sprint. There are moments that um, all parents feel like they've made maybe uh, a gut reaction or a bad choice or you don't know what to do. But keep in mind that is, that is life. And to uh, take a breath, to build the teams that you can rely on, especially in the moments where there are hard decisions, when you build those teams, then you can rely on their expertise for being able to help you know what your choices are. Your teams are there to help you understand your choices. You as the parent are there to make the decisions working with your family and your professionals. So whether it uh, is one of the wonderful people on this um, committee, on this uh, panel, or another one of our wonderful organizations um, in Indiana, please note that there are people who want to be part of the team and it's okay if there are times when you make another decision for a different team member because this is your child and you want to um, be comfortable with the people that are on the team and as Michelle said please do be mindful um, that there is a lot of good information out today but there are some information that's very concerning so that is one of the reasons why it is so important to try to build your team uh, 
um, of individuals that you can trust. Lastly, I'd like to talk just a moment about prioritizing the needs of your family and your child. Only you can decide what the very most pressing needs are. Those usually have to do with communication and safety. Those are two in particular. But please note that there very well might be many, many specialists, uh, many doctors, therapists that come in and sometimes out of your life for the next numerous years. And as your child goes, grows into adulthood, uh, in and out of their life. So it's okay to make a decision that these are the things we're going to work on right now and focus on those. And that just like any other setting, you can't be an expert on absolutely everything and you can't do absolutely everything. And that is okay. So give yourself some grace. Understand that it is important to uh, make a plan and, and have a team and get support, but there are people along the way that are there to help you and really care about you and care about your child. And um, so I hope that this information has been helpful and I'm so thankful that we have um, organizations like the Resource Center for Autism um, and the ARC and InSource and our Department of Ed and uh, Riley Child Development Center and our schools and all of the places that we have in order to help families. Thank you, Lisa. Lauren Telby. All right, thank you so much, Kathy. Um, and so I'm filling in for Tim today, um, but I am very excited to have the opportunity to speak with everyone. Um, I currently work as a clinical psychologist um, at Little Star and my primary role is to conduct diagnostic assessments uh, with children who are suspected of having autism. So this is a topic that's very important to me and I very frequently speak with parents about, you know, what are the next steps after diagnoses? Um, you know, I think what's clear with all of these just really amazing resources and ideas that have already been shared so far today is that there's a lot of help and support and therapy options out there for parents, uh, which is a really great thing. However, at the same time, I think sometimes it can also be very overwhelming. Um, and so I would caution parents to really beware of burnout. Um, one thing I think is common for parents after that initial diagnosis is just this feeling of urgency. You know, I need to do something right away. I need to help right away. Um, and I want to sign up for everything. I want to do all the groups and all the therapies. Um, and I would really, you know, caution families, you know, just slow down a little bit and kind of going along with what Lisa just mentioned is prioritize the skills that are going to be most important to your family and most important to your child and really start there. Um, otherwise, you will overwhelm yourself and your child um, and, and you will burn out quickly. So, you know, really kind of taking a look and saying, you know, what's important to my family? What skills do I really want my child to learn right now? And then you can kind of start there, make a list if you need to, um, and just kind of systematically start crossing it off so you don't overwhelm yourself. Um, related to that, you know, don't forget to, to make time for yourself, to, for your family, just to be together and, and have fun, relax, enjoy your child, um, and, you know, really take that time as well. Focusing on, on support and therapy, you know, it's all very, very important, but as equally important, I believe, is time spent together as a family, growing and learning and just loving um, each other and, and your child. So, um, and finally, you know, it's okay after getting a diagnosis to feel sad, upset, angry as a parent. You know, those, those feelings are completely normal and they're healthy, but sometimes they might need to be processed. And so as others have mentioned, you know, seek support, uh, join a support group, uh, seek individual therapy for yourself if needed. Um, and as difficult as it might seem, you know, so much of your focus tends to really go towards your child during this time. And it is also important to take some of the focus and make sure that you're doing some self-care as well. Um, so making sure that you are taking some time to um, cope yourself and have that support and love from others, because um, that will also help you give the best care to your child. So, um, and that's, that's what I've got. So thank you so much, Kathy, for um, having me be a part of this today. Thanks, Lauren. Susan. 
Uh, that is a great segue into my first point. Um, I respect the grieving process that people need to sometimes go through, but I also think people sometimes, parents, sometimes grieve this future that they imagine for their child and they don't know what the future is going to be. Um, there are gonna be so many people in the world that underestimate what your child is capable of now and in the future. And I would just caution you, don't let that label make you one of those people that underestimate what your child's capable of being. Now that doesn't mean they're gonna be what you, what you want them to be, just like every other child in the world is not exactly what their parents expected them to be. Um, but you want them to be the best and happiest version of themselves. And none of us can predict exactly what that means. Remember that autism is a label. Um, it's a label that's useful because it helps you get services. Uh, but if you th even think about the characteristics of autism, those characteristics are just more extreme versions that we all experience. Think of these distressing times and your reaction to it. I'm sure many of you, like me, have watched your favorite show over and over again. I can't tell you how many episodes of Big Bang Theory that I've watched. Um, and how different is that than the child that wants to watch the Disney movie over and over again? Um, our ability to communicate effectively often goes down when we're in, under situations of distress. And that's just like so many people on the spectrum experience on a daily basis. So although, yes, absolutely, if you need to grieve, grieve. And yes, like Lauren says, reach out for support from parents, from therapists, wherever you need to get that support. I caution you to Grieve a future that you can't imagine yet. And that to, I caution you against assuming that it's going to be a sad or bad future. So that's my first point. Um, my second one is a tricky one. It's about balancing. You will hear about balancing for the rest of your life. How do you do balance maybe the child of your, the needs of your child on the spectrum with your other children? Balance the needs of the financial needs associated with which services you might want. But there's another balancing act that I'm just gonna warn you about early on. Um, there are absolutely some scary things about their associated with autism. Uh, people on the spectrum are more likely to experience anxiety, depression, and they're actually seven times more likely to be abused. And this is a scary thing. Um, however, the thing that when you hear about anxiety, depression, abuse, you wanna do is to protect your child. But when you protect your child too much, you decrease the likelihood that they're going to be independent. And you need them to be independent. Why? Because they're happier when they're independent. They have a higher quality of life when they're independent. They get more of the same experience as other kids when they're more independent. And ironically, when you're more independent, it's a greater buffer for anxiety, depression, and even abuse. And so that's a balancing act that you'll have to figure out that's different for every child and every parent. But I tell you about it now, here in the beginning when you're getting this diagnosis, because I've seen parents protect their children for many, many years, and then suddenly they're almost adults or they're adults and they don't know what to do. And the more you can work toward independence from the beginning, the better off they are. And so I'm just gonna end with this. I realized after I sent these in that as the professor, I should be also sending you information about um, evidence because I know a lot of you have questions about which interventions have evidence of effectiveness. And there was a report that was put out by the National Clearinghouse on Autism evidence and practice this year. And I'm just gonna put in the chat um, the address in case anybody wants to um, take a look at that. Should I put that, let me see. Should I put that in the chat or maybe in the q and A? I I think put everybody- in the Q&A. Susan, put okay. it in the Q&A. So I'll put that in the Q&A, but I just wanna make sure that you all get access to that resource. I'll go ahead and put that in there while Kathy, you can move forward to the next person. Thank you, Susan. Kelly Hartman. Well, I'm also very excited to be here with you guys today. And it's funny, um, as parents who are probably newer to the system, 
you have no idea how uh, exciting this is because I've never seen this many awesome people in a panel um, unless I've been at a, a national conference. So this is a, um, a true treat to be a part of this group today. I have worked in the field for 30 years um, and because I started at the point of service delivery as a provider and a DSP and then a behavioral consultant, I've had the privilege and honor to seeing some folks that I work with grow from children who were newly diagnosed and working with their families to now adults. Um, my perspective as a behavioral consultant over those years has really helped me to see the big picture. And if I had to tell you one thing as a parent of someone with a new diagnosis, it is don't let that moment where you got the diagnosis in the moment where someone said your child will never or the moment that fear filled you up define the rest of your life. Um, don't lower your expectations. Don't lower the bar because you think your kid can't. Um, it is unbelievable that when I look at basic behavioral principles, if I could teach you one thing today, it would be that from your child, you will get more of what you pay the most attention to. And so if you catch them being good and you stay focused on the positive and you look at what they can do, stay super laser focused on empowering all that they can do, you will see such great things. I will also tell you that for those folks that I've worked with for 20 or 30 years, the individuals that I work with who are thriving and who have independence and have developed skills to self-advocate and who are in the workforce had parents who looked at what they could do and stayed focused always on capability, not disability. So you have a, an amazing opportunity um, to, to see things differently. At the same time, we can throw all these resources to you and we could all give you, you know, this website to look at or this podcast to listen to. My second point really is to remember that no matter what, there's still gonna be days where you feel super, super alone and you are convinced that no one has felt the way that you feel today. Um, even in that moment, know that you're not the only person that's been on a journey like this. And if nothing else, there are a bunch of us um, that have worked with parents and can connect you with other people who have also felt alone and can just identify with you in that moment. And so I would, like many other people have said, continue uh, really to focus on those networking capabilities, get connected with other people who are on a similar journey. Um, I love what Lisa said about grace. I mean, grace should be your best friend. Um, I think that is true of anybody with any parents. I feel like I'm challenged right now. I have 15 year old twin boys. I need grace every single day in my life. Um, so really at the end of the day, capability over disability all the time. It's easy to get focused on the negative. I would say 100% your life and your child's life will be so much better if you see the good and focus on that. That's it. Thank you, Kelly. So um, we all did these slides independently. And so I have to laugh that my first line was your child is more than their disability. And you, we have to remind people that your child is going to be about their strengths, their interests, and their personality qualities. And so getting to see the person more than just their disability. So with that said, you're going to have to be, again, the person who understands how your child learns best, their strengths, their interests, and what helps them to exhibit positive behaviors. And um, I, I always worry when I say this that it will sound cheap or it won't, it, you won't, it, it'll sound kind of negative. But in many ways, all of us on the phone, on this Zoom presentation today, are really out there promoting a positive picture of individuals on the spectrum. Because I think too often in the media, people look at these kids in a way that is not positive. And I think what you would find if you sat down with every one of these people is that they would talk to you about the wonderful gifts and the joy that your children have given us. And so I think, you know, we have to be out there and help people see that we have a lot of wonderful folks and I am so blessed to do what I do. Um, several people have talked about intended outcomes and about the use of evidence-based practices. I think when you are adopting evidence-based practices and um, Susan has put it in the chat box, um, and if you need more information about evidence-based practices, please contact us. But you really need to know before you start a therapy, what exactly do you wanna see your child being able to do? 
And is that process, that, that therapy, that educational program, that strategy, the best way to achieve the outcomes you want to see happen for your child? You know, it's been mentioned before, but I'm going to say it again. Make time for other members of your family. Um, make time for the other children in your family. Um, there have been many times in my career where I've been approached by the sibling of someone on the spectrum because they are um, really struggling with the fact that the uh, primary attention is on their, their brother or sister with an autism spectrum disorder. And so, you know, make time for other members of your family and for your spouse. And I know that seems really difficult. Um, it was also mentioned, take care of yourself. Um, this can be a stressful journey in your life. And so you need to make sure that you're taking care of yourself in whatever way that means. And, and we've talked about connecting with parent support groups. I, for years, was involved with parent support groups in Indiana and nationally. And I have found it such a pleasure to be involved with those support groups because we can sit around, we can share information, we can laugh together, we can cry together. It just is really helpful to know that there's other people. Enjoy your child. Um, these are wonderful kids, but enjoy your child. And know you are not alone. You know, you have now just heard from a lot of really wonderful resources in the state, and we want to do what's in the very best interest of your child. So we're here, you know, and I can connect you with the other speakers if you need. And so we're going to take some questions now from folks. <clears throat>